Gorbachev filled his cabinet with political allies, who, like him, were reformers. The new Soviet administration inherited a raft of strained diplomatic situations, including a proxy war in Afghanistan and the US redeployment of medium-range missiles was passionate about the capabilities of nuclear technology. His famous enthusiasm even made it onto the big screen as one of the sources for the ex-Nazi character in Stanley Kubrick's black comedy, Dr. Strangelove. But it was Teller's ideas for harnessing the power of nuclear explosions that would capture Reagan's imagination and plant the idea for the Strategic Defense Initiative. During a visit to NORAD in 1979, Reagan was told that whilst the US could find and track individual missiles during an attack, they could do nothing about it. Two years later, Reagan was elected as the American president and immediately set his advisor to the task of devising a new concept. Initially, a proposal called High Frontier was suggested, a combination of ground-based ABMs or anti-ballistic missiles and a space-based laser system to shoot down the incoming Soviet ICBMs. But High Frontier needed big advances in technology from a research project at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. This project, codenamed Excalibur, aimed to channel a controlled nuclear detonation in low Earth orbit into a battery of expendable X-ray lasers. These lasers had to be powerful enough to destroy incoming missiles in mid-flight before the war had separated. Although testing in the 1970s had been unsuccessful, on November 14, 1980, scientists detonated a two kiloton nuclear device in a kilometer deep underground shaft at the Nevada test site. Project Excalibur scored a success and the X-ray laser showed promise. In the meeting where High Frontier was presented to Reagan, he reportedly lit up with enthusiasm on hearing the details. Decades earlier, the actor turned president had himself starred in a B-movie about an airborne laser weapon in the wartime film, Murder in the Air. On March 23, 1983, President Reagan appeared before the world on television to announce the launch of the Strategic Defense Initiative. His speech made clear that the program aimed to be a technological game changer. The Soviet reaction was outrage and condemnation, according to the thinking that had led both sides to build up stockpiles of offensive weapons Defensive initiatives were destabilizing as they threatened to shatter the existing balance of power. Reagan admitted as much in the words of his speech, this was a bold move and a gamble. The Star Wars program was announced at a time when the USSR was already in turmoil at the top. Three Soviet leaders had died in less than three years. Leonid Brezhnev, Strokov and Konstantin Chernenko. On hearing of Chernenko's death, Reagan reportedly remarked, how am I supposed to get any place with the Russians if they keep dying? On March 11, 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev became the Soviet leader, chosen as part of a new generation keen to revive a stagnant economy. Once in office, Gorbachev filled his cabinet with political allies who, like him, were reformers. The new Soviet administration inherited a raft of strained diplomatic situations, including a proxy war in Afghanistan and the US redeployment of medium-range missiles across Europe. In November 1983, Soviet representatives had walked out of arms control negotiations that year and only agreed to resume talks in 1984 if a treaty banning space weapons was on the agenda. Gorbachev came to the bargaining table at the Reykjavik Iceland summit in 1986 with an offer to shrink the Soviet offensive nuclear arsenal in exchange for cancellation of the Star Wars program. To avoid a new arms race and save his economy, Gorbachev had to neutralize America's new technological initiative. Even as he tried to negotiate an end to the arms race, at home, the Soviet defense industry was milking the opportunity to pursue their most ambitious programs. Priority was given to Buran, the equivalent of NASA's space shuttle, and its launcher, the giant Energia rocket. This launch system was conceived as a way to loft a range of weapons that could neutralize the American SDI satellites, such as the carbon dioxide laser called SCIF. Like Buran, SCIF was symbolically important as it tested the idea that the Soviet Union could offer a symmetric response to Star Wars. Enigir's first launch was scheduled to put SCIF into space on May 15, 1987, as part of the Polyus payload. 
Polyus was officially a science mission loaded with 10 experiments to carry out in the upper atmosphere. Gorbachev himself visited the Baikonur <gasps> Cosmodrome before the launch to expressly oh, forbid any deployment ah, of a ah, weapon that might be seen me. as an act of aggression Please. by US surveillance. Anyone. However, in the end, Skid not... did even less than Gorbachev had expected. When the Energia <clears throat> rocket was launched and released Polyus, a software error caused the payload to rotate too far. Facing backwards, Polyus fired its engines, slowing to fall and break up in the atmosphere shortly afterwards. Although the Soviet space laser never made it into a stable orbit, Reagan had successfully bluffed his opponent into developing and testing a symmetric response to a phantom threat. As the Polyus crashed to Earth, a major review of the American technology found that the space-borne X-ray laser still faced huge challenges and remained out of reach. However, by this time, the US had effectively outmaneuvered the Soviet Union, forcing them into an arms race they could not win. While the American economy enjoyed strong growth throughout the mid to late 1980s, Soviet productivity fell further and further behind. In 1989, the US power was in a spot. Gorbachev's reforms had resulted in domino effects. Policy of speech had led to public criticism of the fathers of the Communist Party, destabilizing the Soviet Gorbachev's announcement of non intervention in Eastern Europe resulted in Warsaw and the Democratic election. In 1991, the Baltic states ceded from the Soviet Union. In December of that year, Gorbachev Designed and officially dissolved the USSR. The super power that had kicked off the space race that the first man in its orbit was finished. So, as always, thanks for watching. But before I go, I'd just like to remind you that the Curious Droid merchandise store is now open and the Curious Droid Facebook group where you can suggest ideas for new videos is also available and finally you can now translate any of the Curious Droid videos if you are a non-native English speaker with the community contributions which we have a video on if you're unsure how to do it in the uploaded videos. So once again thanks for watching and please subscribe, rate and share. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It's probably the most well-known peacetime battle between the United States and the Soviet Union in both technological and ideological terms of the 20th century. And although the USA won the race to the moon, if you've been a betting person mm -hmm. from the mid-1950s to the Come 1960s, to the chances are that you would have thought that the Soviet Union would have a very good chance of getting there first. <laughs> so why didn't Russia put a man on the moon? At the time the Soviets were leading in the space race, they had already started with the launch of Sputnik, then launched several probes to the moon, including one in 1959. These guys may have actually discovered the solution for world peace. Yesterday, all across America, brave young grassroots activists that totally weren't astroturfed by huge leftist organizations skipped class and walked out of school to ensure that gun violence would never ever 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 ever